I'd like to call to order the um, October 23rd, 2019 meeting of the ACIP. Welcome all. Thank you for coming. Um, I will turn this over to our um, Executive Secretary uh, at this point, and then we'll continue with introductions in a minute. Good morning, everyone, and um, I hope you all enjoyed the extra 30 minutes of sleep this morning. Um, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, the proceedings of this meeting are, who are not in attendance are available via the World Wide Web. Welcome to those who cannot attend in person. There are CDC staff at the entrance to the rooms to help guide you, and there's also a desk in the lobby to assist members of the public with questions. We would also ask that people who are um, preparing to speak for public comment this, after, this morning, um, please go to the back and sign up for the public comment, sign in. Handouts of the slides of the presentations have been distributed to the ACIP members and are available for members of the public on the table outside this auditorium. Additionally, the slides are available through a share file link for liaison and ex officio members. Slides presented at this meeting will be posted on the ACIP website approximately three to four weeks after the meeting. The live webcast videos will be posted in approximately four weeks, and meeting minutes are posted to the ACIP website generally within 120 days of the meeting. Um, the meeting minutes from the last meeting will be posted shortly after this meeting. I did want to provide everybody with a little bit of safety information. So to ensure the health and safety of all the individuals attending this meeting, um, I'm going to review a couple of um, safety regulations. In the, event of, in, a, in the event of an emergency resulting in an evacuation, the procedures are as follows. The front of the room should exit through the rear of the room and turn left and then right down the stairs. You can follow me because I, I know how to go. Um, the back of the room, you exit out the rear doors and across the bridge the same way you came in. Um, locate the blue building marker sign labeled conference and meeting space, GCC, and group together to ensure all attendees are accounted for. Once the premises have been secure and an all clear has been issued, you may re-enter the building and we can resume our meeting. Um, there, uh, we do have um, enough time for lunch today and it's a beautiful day. You can go across the street for lunch. Um, we also, I believe, will have, be having Chick-fil-A and you can also go downstairs to the cafeteria. Those are the options for lunch today. Um, and um, the next meeting in February is uh, February 26th and 27th. We're now opening registration for the meeting on the ACIP website when the Federal Register notice is published. And we are closing registration when the registration capacity reaches the number of seats in the room. Um, so registration is required for all meeting attendees. Um, and uh, persons who are international um, visitors need to apply, um, need to register for the meeting um, at least a month in advance. Uh, we'll go on. We have a couple of meeting substitutions for this meeting. Um, we have three substitutions from our ex officios. Uh, we have Sophie Califano, is that pronouncing your name correct, um, is representing the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, Dr. Mary Rubin is representing Health Resources and Services Administration, welcome. And Jillian Doss Walker is, recommend, is, uh, is, uh, the Indian, is representing Indian Health Service, welcome. Um, we have a couple of liaison representative uh, substitutions as well today. Uh, Dr. Paul Seeslack is uh, representing CSTE. Um, and Yasmin, Dr. Yasmin Tyler Hill is uh, representing NMA. Welcome. Um, so we have four new ACIP members we would like to welcome. Um, and Dr. Romero is going to introduce them individually. Um, but we have Lynn Bata, um, Beth Bell sitting over here. Uh, Dr. Kathy Paling and uh, Dr. Pablo Sanchez. Sorry, I should have introduced you all. Um, and uh, Dr. Romero is going to introduce each of you now. Next slide, please. So, Ms. Lynn Bata uh, is uh, an immunization program clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health. Uh, Ms. Bata currently serves as a clinical expert for vaccines. She has uh, 25 years of experience in the field of immunization, including adult and pediatric immunization. She brings with her an extensive experience in adult and pediatric clinical nursing, state and, and uh, local public health uh, issues, vaccine development and clinical trials, and infectious diseases. Welcome. Next slide, please. Dr. Beth Bell 
is clinical professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Dr. Bell leads efforts to improve um, work in the areas of pandemic preparedness and global health security. She spent most of her career in government at the CDC, where she served as the director at, at the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases here at the CDC. She retired in, June, in January of 2017 and now joins us. Thank you very much. Welcome. Next slide, please. Dr. Catherine Poling <clears throat> is Professor of Pediatrics at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Um, she's board certified in pediatrics and an expert on the community impact of vaccines, specifically pneumococcal and influenza vaccines. Um, she is the Wake Forest representative on the North Carolina Immunization Ad uh, Advisory Committee and has collaborated with the CDC uh, on the new vaccine surveillance network and with the CDC on um, its uh, active bacterial core surveillance group. Welcome. Next slide, please. Dr. Pablo Sanchez is professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Ohio State University. Dr. Sanchez is triple board certified in pediatrics, neonatology, and pediatric infectious diseases. He has a distinguished career as a clinical and scientific investigator in neonatal and perinatal infections with major contributions in the area of congenital syphilis, congenital cytomegalovirus infection, respiratory virus uh, RSV infections, neonatal sepsis, antimicrobial stewardship in the neonatal intensive care unit, and immunizations in the premature infants. Welcome, Dr. Sanchez. Next slide. So um, we'd like to take a few minutes to recognize uh, Cindy Pellegrini, um, a member of the ACIP uh, who we lost this year. Um, she's been, she was an integral member and an active contributor to uh, our work. Cindy Pellegrini, or Cindy, as she's known by her member, by her ACIP associates, passed away on July 26, 2019, following a courageous and unyielding battle with ovarian cancer. Cindy was a member of the ACIP from July 1, 2013 to December 31, 2018, serving as its consumer representative as well as a member of multiple ACIP work groups. Cindy's work while on the ACIP impacted the lives of millions of U.S. children and adults by helping craft immunization policy. Those of us who served alongside Cindy during her five-year tenure on the ACIP were fortunate enough to witness her intelligence, empathy, kindness, quick wit, grace, poise, and most of all, humility, as she executed her role and participated in the activities of the ACIP. On the flight to this meeting, I happened to read an article in the New York Times about the growing recognition of humility as an important personality trait. The research now shows that this has become a, a trait that is strongly linked with curiosity, reflection, and open-mindedness. These were characteristics clearly exhibited by Cindy. She listened to everyone, challenged scientists and thought leaders at the appropriate times, and pushed the ICIP to become a stronger committee serving the public. Cindy transformed the role of consumer representative. She conferred a truly personal and unique touch <clears throat> to that role by personally writing letters to each individual that offered public comment during every ACIP meeting. She continuously reminded us, the members of the ACIP, of the children, adults, parents, grandparents, who are the reason the ACIP members put so much of their heart into each decision we make. John Temet, ACIP chair from 2011 to 2015, said of Cindy, we, are we were truly blessed by her presence at the ACIP. Cindy was a wonderful and kind person who acted with dedication and compassion and purpose. Nancy Bennett, our chair from 2015 to 2018, expressed it so well by saying, Cindy brought a different sort of wisdom to the ACIP. She was not steeped in the medical and research paradigm that encompassed and sometimes blinded us. Rather, she brought with her a fresh and thoughtful perspective grounded in common sense and deep commitment to the public, all of the public. Amanda Cohn, our current executive secretary, said of Cindy, she is one of my 
mentors, a balanced, uh, she balanced life so beautifully and was so proud of and full of love for her family and children. The world is left a little emptier by Cindy's passing. Let us always remember, our, to, let us always remind ourselves that we should attempt to fill that void in her honor. This is a quote from Cindy. Uh, while she was sick, um, she did a blog for the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. She says, these days vaccines are especially important to us because I'm a cancer patient. I worry a lot about catching the flu since my immune system is weakened. When my son went to college last fall, he texted us a few weeks later to let us know he'd just gotten his flu shot at one of the college clinics. He did it, he said he did it to protect me. Um, and I think this quote from Cindy just personifies everything about her um, in the way that she humanized the um, importance of vaccines to um, individual people. And um, we wanted to let everyone know um, that more details will be announced soon, but we are developing um, an award that will be given out at the National Immunization Conference um, that will be called the Cindy Pellegrini Immunization Award for Outstanding Public Engagement. Um, and um, we are looking forward to um, announcing that soon. Thanks. Um, moving on um, to public comment, um, uh, which is a nice segue. Um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is at its heart a public body. Engagement with the public and transparency in our processes is vital to the committee's work. As part of the ACIP's commitment to continuous improvement, um, we've recently strengthened this process. So for this meeting, we'll be holding an oral public comment meeting prior to lunch and prior to the votes, which are scheduled for early this afternoon. The oral public comment meet will take place at, um, the oral public comment will take place at 11, 30 a.m. Um, there's also written public comment that uh, people were invited to submit to regulations.gov. That will be open for 72 hours after the meeting ends, and um, the ACIP members have had access to all of those public comments, and I do encourage everyone to <coughs> read those public comments um, that are uh, at regulations.gov. Um, I don't have the docket number here, but it is on the ACIP website. Next slide. Oh, here's the docket. Excellent. Um, next slide. Members of the ACIP agree to forego participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. CDC has issued limited conflict of interest waivers as follows. Members who conduct vaccine clinical trials or serve on data safety monitoring boards are prohibited from participating in committee votes related to those vaccines. And regarding the other vaccines of the concerned company, a member may participate in the discussions with the provision that he or she abstains from all votes related to the vaccines of that company. At the beginning of each meeting, and um, now at the beginning of each vote, um, we're asking for ACIP members to state any conflicts of interest related to that vote. Um, and at the beginning of the meeting, when we do roll call, we'll ask for any conflicts of interest. Next slide. Um, so please turn off your cell phones and we will go ahead and begin roll call. So uh, I will now uh, take roll call with the members. Um, the current voting members, please indicate if you're present and disclose any conflict of interest. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Fry, if, you may, if we will. Present, no conflicts of interest. Uh, Bell, present, no conflicts. Hunter, no conflicts. <laughs> McNally, no conflicts. Paling, no conflicts. Hank Bernstein, no conflicts. Peter Szilagyi, no conflicts. Robert Atmar, no conflicts. Kip Talbot, no conflicts. Bata, no conflicts. Kevin Alt, no conflicts. Sanchez, no conflicts. Grace Lee, no conflicts. Senator Romero, no conflicts. Now, starting with uh, Dr. Massionier, uh, we will then have the ex officio members and liaison members introduce themselves, and please include the name of the agency or organization you are representing. 
Good morning, everybody. Nancy Messonnier, the director of the Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at CDC. Good morning, everybody. Tammy Beckham, director of the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Good morning, John Bago, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIH. Good morning, Mary Rubin, Chief Medical Officer, Division of Injury Compensation Programs for Health Resource Service Administration. Good morning, Doran Fink, Deputy Director for Clinical Review in the Office of Vaccines, FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Good morning, Eric Dusing, Department of Defense. Good morning, Jillian Doss Walker, Interim IHS Program Manager, Indian Health Service. Good morning, Sophie Califano, Deputy Chief Consultant for Preventive Medicine at NCP with Department of Veterans Affairs. Amy Middleman, representing the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Uh, Sean O'Leary, representing the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Yasmin Tyler Hill, representing Patricia Whitley uh, for the National Medical Association. David Weber, representing Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Patsy Stinchfield, representing the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Uh, Clem Lewin, representing the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Matt Zahn, representing National Association of County and City <coughs> Health Officials. Bill Schaffner, on behalf of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Carol Baker, Infectious Disease Society of America. Paul Cieslack, for the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Phyllis Arthur for the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Nate Smith representing the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Christine Finley for the Association of Immunization Managers. Steve Foster, American Pharmacist Association. Stan Grog, American Osteopathic Association. Chad Riddle, American Nurses Association. Sandra Freihofer, American Medical Association. Jason Goldman, American College of Physicians. Rebecca Coyle, American Immunization Registry Association. Linda Eckert, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Carol Hayes, the American College of Nurse Midwives. Susan Even, American College Health Association. Marie-Michelle Leger, American Academy of Physician Assistants. David Kimberlin, AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, Red Book. Bonnie Maldonado, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, Red Book Committee. Pamela Rockwell, American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you all very much. All right, we will proceed um, to our first topic, which is uh, pertussis vaccines, with an introduction by Dr. Hank Bernstein. Good morning, everyone. It's tough being a digital immigrant. Thank you. So the a ACIP currently recommends that all non-pregnant adolescents and adults aged 11 years and older receive a single dose of Tdap, preferably at ages 11 to 12, to ensure continued protection against tetanus and diphtheria, booster doses of TD are recommended every 10 years. The single Tdap dose can replace a decennial TD booster dose, and the dose of Tdap, when indicated, should be administered regardless of the interval since the last tetanus and diphtheria toxoid-containing vaccine. TD may also be recommended for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management if a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine has not been administered in the previous five years. The catch-up immunization series for persons not fully vaccinated against pertussis, diphtheria, and tetanus is a three-dose series of one Tdap, preferably the first, 
followed by two doses of TD. In order to prevent infant pertussis, pregnant women are recommended to receive a dose of Tdap with every pregnancy, irrespective of the patient's prior history of receiving the vaccine, and regardless of the interval since prior vaccination with TD or Tdap. Note that this is an off-label recommendation, and the work group did not evaluate any changes to the routine pregnancy recommendation. Our work group has specific terms of reference. We were to consider the evidence for a potential policy change to allow either TD or Tdap vaccine to be used in situations where now only TD vaccine is currently recommended. The three circumstances are the decennial booster in adults, tetanus prophylaxis as needed for wound management, and in the catch-up immunization schedule. The policy options for ACIP consideration today are either TD or Tdap can be used for the decennial TD booster, either TD or Tdap can be used for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound prophylaxis, and either TD or Tdap can be used for additional doses of the catch-up immunization schedule for persons greater than or equal to seven years of age. Today's session will have two additional speakers. Dr. Pedro Morrow from the Immunization Safety Office will discuss the safety of closely spaced Tdap vaccines in the catch-up immunization schedule. Dr. Fiona Havers, our Pertussis Vaccines Work Group Lead, she makes us look good, is going to talk about Tdap and TD and a summary of the work group considerations and the policy uh, options. Now, we have been asked uh, by NCIRD leadership to evaluate the spacing between booster doses of vaccines for tetanus and diphtheria which is currently recommended every 10 years. Note that this is um, a question to separate then, uh, then from a separate question from our terms of reference. So we are not discussing this, but this is something we're, we're going to look at in the future. We want to uh, understand whether or not we uh, can substitute Tdap in situations where TD is currently recommended. The question of spacing of booster doses has arisen given information about the duration of protection against tetanus and diphtheria. Some countries don't give TD boosters and others give TD booster doses less frequently than every 10 years. This question will be evaluated and the evidence evaluated whether the current 10-year interval between TD booster doses should be changed is something for the future. This is not part of our terms of reference with today's discussion. All of our work groups are in hugely dependent on multiple individuals and their input from multiple people. Besides myself, uh, Paul Hunter is another ACIP member. We have the three ex officio members listed on the left. The liaison representatives make notable contributions. We had invited consultants, both uh, Dr. Kathy Edwards and Dr. Sarah Long, and of course, uh, Fiona Havers, who you'll hear from shortly. And of course, there are multiple people at the CDC that contribute to all that we do. And you can see here the Division of Bacterial Diseases, the Immunization Services Division, and the Immunization Service uh, Safety Office all uh, actively participate. So I wanted to turn uh, the microphone over to Dr. Pedro Morrow to share some of the safety information. Okay. 
Uh, good morning. So I'll be discussing the, uh, the safety of closely spaced uh, TDA vaccines in the catch-up immunization schedule. So uh, this slide shows the uh, uh, current and the proposed uh, catch-up schedule. Uh, and uh, the, the current schedule, after uh, an initial TDAP, uh, uh, there are two TDs, uh, one first at one month and the other one at six to 12 months. In the proposed policy option and under, under consideration, uh, either TD or TDAP uh, would be given at one month and at uh, six to 12 months. Uh, however, there's limited data, there's limited safety data on the current versus the proposed catch-up schedule. Uh, and an approach to address these issues is to look at published and unpublished data on the safety of immunization regimens uh, similar to the proposed schedule, or to look at the uh, safety of administering closely spaced Tdap doses. And by closely spaced, uh, we mean um, uh, 12 months or less. So, so the objectives of this uh, presentation are first to review published literature on studies that have assessed the safety of closely spaced TDAP. And I'm going to show a comparative study of, uh, a, of closely spaced TD doses and a second study, of, a second descriptive non-comparative uh, study. And a second uh, objective is to review and publish safety data on closely spaced TDAP from CDC's uh, vaccine safety monitoring systems from the Vaccine Adverse uh, Event Reporting System and from the Vaccine Safety Data Link. So in terms of the uh, published studies, uh, there's uh, one study that, uh, that was, uh, was a double-blind randomized controlled clinical trial or, that enrolled 460 adults uh, from three, three European countries and the study had three arms uh, and the uh, subjects uh, received uh, the vaccines following a 0 one six month schedule. Now the vaccines that were used, the Tdap uh, has an antigenic uh, composition very similar to the uh, US uh, Boosterix. And now the Tdap IPV is of course a vaccine that is not licensed uh, for use in the United States. But uh, uh, one group received uh, three doses of Tdap, a second group received one dose of Tdap IPV followed by two doses of TD, and the third group was the comparison group, the control group, received three doses of uh, TD vaccine. The outcomes were immunogenicity and reactogenicity, and there, there were no statistically significant uh, differences in, in local or general symptoms between groups. Now, a second study is a cohort study of maternal Tdap reactogenicity that uh, where 374 pregnant women and 225 non-pregnant women participated. Uh, however, the study subpopulation of interest uh, were uh, eight pregnant women who had more than one Tdap within the past 12 months. Uh, the outcomes uh, in the study were injection site and systemic reactions. Uh, none of the women had uh, any severe local or systemic reactions. So in terms of the unpublished analysis from BEARS, before I present the uh, unpublished data from BEARS, uh, I'd like to point out the, uh, the limitations, uh, the strengths and limitations of BEARS. Uh, BEARS is a national uh, passive surveillance system uh, co-managed by CDC and the FDA. Uh, it has uh, some strengths. Well, one is that it's a national system. It can rapidly detect safety signals, and it can uh, also detect uh, rare adverse events. Uh, but it has a number of limitations, uh, and among them, one is uh, lack of an unvaccinated comparison group. There's no denominator, so it's not possible to calculate the incidence or prevalence of an adverse event uh, or make any uh, calculations in, the, in measures of, of risk. Uh, and also, it generally cannot assess causality. So in, in BEARS, to, to look for closely spaced TDAP reports, uh, we search uh, the BEARS database from uh, January 1st, 1990 to June 30th, 2019. Uh, we reviewed BEARS reports and any medical records to assess for the length of the interval between doses and the adverse event. And reports where the interval of two TDAP doses was 12 months or less were included in the final analysis. 
So among 34,804 reports of Tdap submitted to VAERS during the search period, 342 involved multiple doses of Tdap. And in 88 reports, uh, the interval of two Tdap doses was 12 months or less. Uh, a majority or 76% did not describe an adverse event. Th these were vaccination errors. And uh, among reports with uh, adverse events, uh, the most common were injection site reactions in, in eight reports. So uh, in terms of the unpublished uh, data from the VSD, there are two sources of unpublished data. The first one is uh, uh, data from a VSD retrospective cohort study uh, evaluating repeated Tdap doses. This is a supplementary analysis on an existing data set. And the study subpopulation of interest uh, was comprised of 13,599 non-pregnant uh, adolescents and adults who received Tdap or TD within 12 months of a prior Tdap. The comparison groups were um, 11,687 Tdap versus 1,912 TD vaccines given within 12 months of a prior Tdap. And the outcomes were pre-specified local reactions and neurological adverse events. Uh, there were no, uh, repeated Tdap was not associated with an increase in any adverse event compared to TD within 12 months of a prior Tdap. Uh, a second source of unpublished uh, information is uh, a, a study from the VS, a VSD retrospective cohort study evaluating maternal Tdap safety. The study saw population of interest were 187 women with multiple Tdap vaccines during the same pregnancy, and they were excluded from the larger published study. And the outcomes were acute adverse events and adverse uh, birth outcomes. Uh, one of the, of the 187 women had an acute event following multiple TIDA vaccines in the, uh, uh, in the same pregnancy. Uh, this person had an ICD-9 code of limb pain and limb swelling seven days after vaccination. Uh, and, and this occurred on the day of delivery, but the affected limb was unspecified. So it's not clear if there is uh, an association because uh, this occurred toward the toward the end, seven days. We would expect uh, 48 hours to 72 hours if if it were um, vaccine related, and also we don't know the extremity where the uh, uh, adverse event occur. Uh, birth outcome rates were similar to pregnant women exposed to a single Tdap Tdap dose during the same pregnancy. So in summary, for the published studies, well, I, I described uh, the first study was a, a clinical trial that actually used a, a number of uh, regimens that uh, have some resemblance to the, uh, the regimens in the uh, uh, current and the proposed catch-up schedule. And there were no differences in reactogenicity between Tdap uh, versus TD. The second study is a descriptive study that uh, were the a population of interest was very small, only eight women. None had any uh, severe local or systemic reactions. Uh, so summarizing the, uh, the unpublished data in bears, uh, most reports of excess doses of Tdap in bears did not describe an adverse event. And among reports with adverse events, local reactions were most commonly reported. Uh, in the VSD, among subjects who received a Tdap dose 12 months or less, Compared to TD, no increased rates of adverse events were observed. Uh, among 187 women in the VSD who received multiple Tdap doses in the same pregnancy, one presented with limb pain and limb swelling seven days after vaccination. So in conclusion, uh, published data on closely spaced Tdap doses shows no increase in adverse events uh, when Tdap or TD uh, was administered as a second or third dose. Uh, Regimen similar to the current and proposed catch-up schedule did not show differences in reactogenicity. Unpublished data uh, of closely spaced Tdap doses shows no unusual or increased reporting of any adverse event. And while data on multiple Tdap doses is limited, our review of published and unpublished safety data is reassuring. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, the following individuals from the Immunization Safety Office and from Kaiser Permanente in Seattle, Washington. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Moto. 
Um, so next, we're going to hold questions until after the, all the presentations are, are given. Um, we're going to have um, Dr. Havers present uh, TDAP and DT summary of uh, workgroup considerations and proposed policy options. Dr. Havers. Thank you, Dr. Morrow, for that presentation. For the remainder of the session, I'm going to summarize the workgroup's assessment of the safety data. I will also talk about a clarification of current CDC guidance. We will then summarize, briefly summarize the workgroup considerations and present proposed text for the policy options. The workgroup reviewed data for the safety of using Tdap in place of TD for catch-up immunization and concluded that although data were limited, the randomized controlled trial that compared Tdap and TD for the three-dose series was reassuring, as were other published and unpublished data as presented by Dr. Morrow. The workgroup also noted that there were no concerning safety signal in multiple sources of data, including in pregnant women, although data are sparse on multiple doses of Tdap during a, a single pregnancy, and that there is need for continued safety monitoring. Given this, and as presented at the ACIP meeting in June, the workgroup was in favor of allowing either TD or Tdap to be used for additional doses of catch-up immunization in, in the catch-up immunization schedule for persons seven years and older both in the general population and for pregnant women. Before we move on to the proposed text for the policy option, there is a clarification of CDC guidance that I am sharing for your awareness. This is not something that needed to be voted on by ACIP, but I wanted to mention it, as you will see it in the policy note and also potentially on the childhood immunization schedule. Current guidance states that children seven through 10 years of age who receive Tdap inadvertently or for the catch-up immunization, or for catch-up immunization, should receive another Tdap at age 11 through 12 years. We've received many questions from state health departments, immunization programs, providers, and other stakeholders about 10-year-olds who received Tdap for school entry requirements. They asked whether or not they do need to receive another Tdap at age 11 to 12. Of note, both Tdap vaccines are licensed down to 10 years of age. We plan to simplify these recommendations for providers to say that seven through nine-year-olds who receive Tdap for any reason should receive the adolescent Tdap booster at 11 to 12 years of age. On the other hand, a Tdap given to a child 10 years or older can count as the adolescent Tdap dose, and it does not need to be repeated. Similar changes are made to clarify guidance on inadvertent Dtap administration in this age range. This clarification will be included in the upcoming policy note and potentially in the childhood immunization schedule. So, we will now come back to our terms of reference, which ask the work group to evaluate whether either TD or Tdap should be allowed for use in settings where, on where only TD is currently recommended for the decennial booster, tetanus prophylaxis for wound management, and the catch-up immunization schedule. As you will recall, the work group presented its evidence to recommendation framework at the last meeting in June, a summary slide of which is shown here. The work group's interpretation was that allowing this change would give increased flexibility to providers, and that while there may be some additional benefit for pertussis control, there was not enough evidence to preferentially recommend Tdap over Td in these settings. They concluded that there were no substantive safety concerns, and given this, the benefits of the recommendation outweigh potential harms. The work group also concluded that providers value flexibility and that there is evidence that Tdap has largely replaced Td, regardless of current recommendations, which indicates that the change would be valued by stakeholders and that it is likely acceptable and feasible. Although Tdap is more expensive than Td, economic analyses had limited utility. Given that the, that the change has been widely implemented already, regardless of the higher cost and the uncertainty of key parameters in the various economic models, economic impact was not a major consideration for the work group in these questions. As presented at the last meeting, the work group was in favor of the policy option to allow either TD or Tdap to be used in settings where only TD is currently recommended for the decennial booster, for tetanus prophylaxis in the setting of wound management, and in the catch-up immunization schedule. Before I present the proposed text for the potential policy changes, I want to remind you 
that if ACIP does vote to change the recommendations for the use of Tdap, there will be several situations in which recommendations would be for off-label uses. This slide, which was shown at the last meeting in June, shows the two licensed Tdap products with a summary of their FDA approved indications for usage and administration shown in the, in the second column. The last three columns indicate where use of these products would be for off-label, would be off-label if recommendations were, are changed. Off-label indications based on age have not changed. New off-label indications for Adacel would include an additional routine or catch-up TD dose beyond a second dose administered eight or more years from a first Tdap dose, if, given, if not given for wound prophylaxis within the specified guidance. For Boostrix, any additional doses given beyond the single license dose would be off-label. I am now going to move on to the proposed language for the policy issues under consideration. Note that if changes are made, recommendations for persons 7 through 18 years and those 19 years and older will be listed in separate sections. But the proposed language for both groups is identical in most instances and, where noted, have been combined on the following slides. Note that important words that are changed will be highlighted. In most instances, the highlighted text was changed from TD to either TD or TDAP. So, for the decennial booster in persons with documentation of previous Tdap, the sentence will be changed to read, to ensure continued protection against tetanus and diphtheria, booster doses of either TD or Tdap should be administered every 10 years throughout life. For tetanus prophylaxis for wound management in persons with previous documentation of Tdap, the sentence will be changed to read, for non-pregnant persons with documentation of previous vaccination with Tdap, either TD or Tdap should be used if a tetanus toxoid-containing vaccine is indicated. For the catch-up immunization series, the proposed text reads, for persons aged 7 through 18 years of age and those 19 years and older, who have never been vaccinated against pertussis, tetanus, or diphtheria, should receive a series of te three tetanus and diphtheria toxoid containing vaccines, which includes at least one dose of Tdap. The preferred schedule is a dose of Tdap followed by a dose of either TD or Tdap at, at, le at least four weeks afterward, and another dose of either TD or Tdap six to 12 months later. Persons aged seven through 18 years and 19 years and older who are not fully immunized against pertussis, tetanus, or diphtheria should, should receive one dose of Tdap, preferably the first, in the catch-up series. If additional tetanus toxoid-containing doses are required, either TD or Tdap vaccine can be used. Note that the catch-up immunization schedule for pregnant women and the general population is the same, but there is an additional paragraph in current guidance on the prevention of obstetric and neonatal tetanus. We have not changed the text of that paragraph, but for clarity, propose adding the highlighted sentence that reads, if more than one dose of a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine is needed, either TD or Tdap vaccine can be used for those doses. In summary, the policy option under consideration is whether recommendations should be changed to allow either TD or Tdap vaccine to be used in situations where only TD vaccine is currently recommended for the decennial booster, for tetanus prophylaxis for wound management, and in the catch-up immunization schedule, including in pregnant women. We have presented the proposed text for the policy option under consideration, and we would now like to hear what ACIP has to say. Thank you, Dr. Havers. This topic is now open for discussion and questions. So I, I, I'd like to uh, first make a, a comment on the seven-day uh, limb swelling um, that was reported. Um, that's entirely consistent with what's been observed with acellular pertussis uh, vaccine. For example, Keitel and colleagues reported in 1999 uh, looking at a series of different acellular pertussis vaccines in adults that... Uh, it was paradoxical to us at, at the time, but um, this either redness or swelling could occur at four to seven days after uh, vaccination. So it's, it's not inconsistent with uh, what's been described previously for pertuss acellular pertussis vaccines. 
I guess um, my comment is it seems like uh, this recommendation is coming as a, or the consideration is coming um, from a practical standpoint, and we really don't have a lot of safety information that's been gathered. I um, mean, the, the data that was presented is reassuring, but um, uh, it, we, we really don't have the tens of thousands of people who've um, received this, unless I uh, missed something. And, and I guess that's the only thing that gives me a little bit of pause. What was the work group uh, unanimous in their uh, endorsement of these three? The work group was unanimous in their endorsement that TD, that TDAP should be allowed to, either TD or TDAP should be allowed to replace TD. There was no one that felt that the recommendations needed to stay the same. There were a couple of people on the work group that favored a preferential recommendation for TDAP to replace TD, but in general, um, the work group as a whole felt there wasn't enough evidence to support that. Dr. Hunter, would you like to comment? Okay. Um, I so, sorry. was waiting to be recognized by the <laughs> yeah. chair. Yes, um, go ahead. Um, I, uh, Robert, I think that um, I don't think we have the data to show, to, to support what I'm just about to say. However, I think it makes sense that um, given the statistics we saw and how often TD, TDAP is being used, that we could assume that there are already tens of thousands of people who are getting a second dose of TDAP. And yes, we are relying on a passive reporting system with VAERS, but I personally, as a work group member, felt that that was very reassuring. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Dr. Fry. I just uh, wanted to verify. Uh, we, we did talk in the past about the number of children that were uh, small for age, uh, the newborns, and I think we decided that that was not uncommon or unusual if there was a comparison amongst people uh, just in general. I just wanted to verify that the small for age um, number that we had seen, it's not, not really a number, it was uh, s some children were small for age, uh, really didn't impact our thinking. And also, I was just curious about the economic um, analysis, how, how big of a difference was there in the cost? I know that it doesn't impact uh, the subgroup, the working group's uh, uh, evaluation, but I was just curious to see what the difference was, if anybody remembers off the top of their head, not to go digging. It was, uh, as I recall, I think it was a Dr. $10. Yeah. I'm sorry. I Dr. Bernstein. <laughs> Please wait until you're recognized by the chair before speaking. <laughs> sorry. Um, my apologies. Uh, as I recall, there was a $10 uh, uh, price differential overall between the use of TDAP versus TD. Could we also see slide 28? We have the pricing difference from the from the public, publicly available data. So if, if you go to slide 28 in this presentation. This is the cost differential between TD um, and TDAP based on C the CDC vaccine price list and then also on the commercial, um, based on commercial claims from market scan, which are privately insured patients. So you can see there is a cost differential. I will say that we did actually present data from economic analyses to the work group. Um, and so this was gone over in detail, but the work group felt strongly that rather than getting into the weeds at ACIP, they felt that given that we were not advocating for a preferential recommendation of TDAP over TD and that this change had been widely implemented, that this, that regardless of the economic analyses, this, they felt comfortable making the, re making this recommend or proposing this potential policy change without going into great detail at ACIP about the economic analyses. Um, so that was the discussion that we had, but we did review the economic data. And well, I, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry, forgive me. I, I, I did want to also uh, make sure that Dr. Fry's first question was answered. I don't know if Dr. Morrow, if you want to come up and, and answer the question about the small for gestational age. That was um, in reference to slide 16. Uh, the slide 16 in Dr. Morrow's presentation. 
Yes. While we're pulling that up, I will say that um, Dr. Morrow did look at what we were looking specifically at was whether or not more than one dose of Tdap within a single pregnancy in the very narrow setting of a woman requiring more than one TD containing vaccine for catch up immunization was what we were looking at in this setting. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Morrow. Yeah, excuse me, what, what was the question? Uh, sorry, it was uh, in regards to the last bullet, uh, the adverse birth outcomes, small for gestational age, preterm delivery, and low birth weight. The question was, is this is, uh, we see this a lot, and we I, I think based on our previous conversation, we decided this would not be out of the norm for the general population, and I just wanted to uh, clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, the reason I, we included these here is because these was part, these were the outcomes from a, um, uh, a, a larger um, maternal TDAP safety study. It was already published. Uh, at the time, you know, there was, these outcomes were of, of interest, and, and these outcomes were also evaluated in the, in the Sioux group that I present the data on, the, in the 187 women, because that, that, that group actually was excluded from the larger study because they received multiple TDAP doses. But that, that's the reason this, this is presented here. Yeah. Can I try asking her question again? Um, what Please. she's asking is whether there is data that tells you whether this number of adverse birth outcomes, specifically small for gestational age, preterm delivery, and low birth weight, in this study is disproportionate compared to what you would expect to see in the general public, in, not in this study. In other words, you're calling it an outcome. So is that a signal that there is a potential issue here? No, the rates actually were um, uh, comparable to uh, the background rates, yes. Very good. Uh, Dr. Alt. I do also want to just point out this slide, since we have these up here, that we did ask um, to do a sub-analysis of this already published study when we're looking at closely spaced Tdap vaccines. And as you can see, we actually do have in this sub-analysis of unpublished data, 11,000 people who received Tdap and then later received either TD or Tdap, which is what the, what the proposed change would be, would be going from having an additional dose of TD, and here they had additional doses of Tdap. So we actually have 11, 000, about 13,000 people, 11,000 of whom received Tdap within 12 months of receiving their first Tdap, and compared with a group who'd received TD, which would be the current recommendations. And this data we found very reassuring, that there was no difference in safety signals between those receiving additional TDAP versus those receiving additional TD. And we'd particularly like to thank Mike Jackson at Kaiser Permanente Northwest for doing this analysis specifically for our ACIP work group to evaluate this question. Now, Dr. Alt. As far as the pregnant population goes, I was representing the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists when we talked about uh, Tdap the first time around six or eight years ago. And I was impressed with the amount of data there were from the middle of the last century, 1940s, 50s, and 60s, concerning pertussis containing vaccines or tetanus containing vaccines. So it's, it's been thought about for a long time, and it's also the global norm for pregnant women to get more than one dose of tetanus to prevent neonatal tetanus you know, outside the United States. So I think there's a lot of peripheral data maybe we didn't touch on today. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I was just gonna follow up, but I think the, uh, uh, Dr. Havers commented on it specifically, which was the question about the differential cost, because I actually was wondering about the economic analysis as well. But I, if, I, if, if it's not a preferential decision, then in my mind it's more of a vaccine choice so in that instance, and I don't think an economic analysis is necessary in part because we're not uh, requesting a preferential decision. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. Amar. So I, I, um, coming back, if, if we adopt this, and in fact the use right now is so uh, greatly weighted towards use of Tdap anyway, um, do we see the extinction of TD use in this country? And, and that's, I mean, that's not necessarily a, a bad thing, but um, 
if there's so little being used, it would seem like there would not be an economic reason to continue to produce it. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. So I think TD, um, from my small experience in Milwaukee uh, as the advisor, medical um, consultant to a local health department, is I think local health departments and maybe um, uh, we can get some comment from people who know a little bit more about nationally about this. Um, it would be that uh, TD will still be used um, in certain uh, situations, um, in clinics that are really catching people up, in refugee clinics that have, you know, um, very uh, strict cost restraints and are doing a lot of catching up where they have multiple doses. But I think for the, my personal opinion is that for the average, you know, family medicine clinic or internal medicine clinic where you're doing decennial boosters and it's going to be a lot simpler and easier just to have one vaccine. So, yeah. Any other, uh, Dr. Baker. When Tdap was recommended for every pregnancy, there was a huge discussion here about safety, as there should be because there was so little data. And I think everybody's heard that there's now robust data that it is safe in pregnant women. But one of the questions, one of the concerns was the Arthas phenomenon. So my question to Dr. Havers, Dr. Moore, is this excessive limb swelling phenomenon that we've seen in children and now in a few adults. Is this an Arthas phenomenon? I say no, but I'm asking you. Well, well what I can say about bears is that, uh, because I work with bears, uh, is that there's very, uh, it's very, uh, Arthas reactions are very rarely reported in, in bears. I mean, there, there may be some, but uh, uh, it's not that, is not that commonly uh, reported, uh, at least disproportionately. And uh, and from what I've seen in the BSD, I think there is also very uh, little of it. Um, I mean, I cannot mention a rate. I don't. I'm not familiar with the data, but uh, um, I think it's very rare in even in the BSD. Thank you. Thank you. So from the internal medicine perspective, and certainly as a private practitioner, uh, giving the Tdap every 10 years or as opposed to TD, it's practical. The cost purchasing is about the same equivalent, at least in the private sector. So I'm certainly personally in favor of this change because it's really what we're doing now and very effective in making sure the patients get vaccinated every 10 years. Thank you, Dr. Stinchfield. Yeah, Patsy Stinchfield from NAPNAP. Um, just a comment, I was, uh, where I work at Children's Hospital in Minnesota, we've seen some very severe cases of pertussis in our ICUs this summer. And at our critical care meeting yesterday, not that anyone in this room needs a reminder of why we vaccinate, but um, some of the ECMO national data was shared. And um, for children with pertussis who go on ECMO, the survival rate is only 28%. Um, and so I'm very supportive of adding Tdap in. Thank you for those comments, uh, Dr. Zahn. Uh, thanks, Matt. Z Matt Zahn with NHO. Uh, a couple of comments. One is uh, just to follow up on Paul's comment. I, I just have the local uh, public health experience in Orange County in California, but my just my gestalt is about the same thing that there will be a small but distinct uh, utility for TD in the future. Uh, I, I just have a question to make sure I understand the work groups thing. Just to clarify this, the biggest questions we get are uh, Tdap for healthcare workers and for people who are, are going to be around newborns. Uh, my presumption here is that this blanket recommendation is kind of just for everybody. There isn't, there, the work group isn't considering these particular groups as a, as a, as a particular thing. I, just to make sure I understand that. Okay. I can comment on that, or actually, Dr. Weber is on our work group, and we just specifically discussed um, whether or not healthcare workers should be recommended to receive Tdap preferentially. But um, Dr. Weber, do you want to discuss what? Uh, yes. So certainly, uh, Shay is uh, very supportive of this, and as was already mentioned, we think that uh, virtually everyone will begin using Tdap in replacement of TD. So there wasn't a need to 
That was the first issue to specifically call out healthcare personnel. And the other issue uh, is uh, the vaccine is not felt to be so protective. The recommendation is still to give antibiotic post-exposure prophylaxis. So uh, based on those two issues, we felt we didn't need to call out uh, healthcare personnel. But Che as a group is uh, uh, very supportive of this change. Dr. Finley. Christine Finley, Association of Immunization Managers. Um, state health um, programs, immunization programs, follow ACIP guidance. And when the ACIP guidance is um, something that they have trouble following, it, it creates a challenge. So when we're saying you need to carry TD, many providers have said, I don't want to use it, I don't want to carry it. And so then there's been waste following some of that. And we've known that they tend to do what we're seeing here, so it would be it would make life much easier for those of us that are providing guidance to primary care providers and others. Thank you, Dr. Tallett. I just wanted to go back to Dr. Baker's comment. I think that's very important. Adults occasionally do have extensive limb swelling from certain vaccines, including acellular pertussis. It is not a serious adverse event. It is, um, is uncomfortable but has no long lasting effects. And I think it's important that we recognize that so that when it does happen, we can talk to our patients and explain it and say, this will resolve, there will be no sequelae. Um, but it's important that we discuss it openly. Thank you for that comment. Uh, Dr. Weber. Do you already? Okay, very good. Any other comments or questions? Are we ready to make a motion? Do you want to go back to the slide yes. about what you're asking the motion to be made? Can you? I make a... Uh, Dr. Bernstein. I make a motion that uh, the three... Uh, uh, th three circumstances. Uh, well, I guess we'll start with the decennial TD booster. Give us just one second. We're switching between presentations here. We have to do one at a time? Do we have to do one at a time? No, it's a single, no, single motion for all three you can do. All right. I make a, a motion that all three recommended policy changes be accepted. And we, we'll need to have that up so that everybody can look at that. Just a moment. We'll take a second and just a second. A second and a second. Say it again. This is the proposed language for all of the, the policy changes, for the single policy change for all three aspects. Dr. Hunter. And I second the proposed language as it appears on the screen. Is there any further discussion or questions? Okay, then I think we're ready to take a vote. No, so, no, 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 no. We're holding the vote. Oh, we're holding the, <laughs> holding the vote till the end, excuse me. Excuse me, till so, the end of public comment. So yeah, just to remind everybody, we make yes. the motion and then we, we stay the vote yes. after the discussion um, and we'll have public comment before lunch and then we'll do votes after lunch. So we'll be back to this. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Um, I, we're ready for a break.